Okay, let's pray. Father, we want to thank you for this morning, Lord. We want to thank you for your word. Now, I pray, Holy Spirit, as uh, Lord, as we have a look at some passages in this collection of ancient documents, Lord, I pray each individual here, Father, would you let us see what it is that you want us to see this morning? The Holy Spirit, would you let each of us individually hear what it is that you want us to hear this morning, Father? We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay, hey, we've been, uh, can we check Romans chapter 12, verse 2 up there on the board? We've been looking at the whole idea of uh, renewing our mind. Uh, or in some cases, perhaps uh, some people sitting here, you recognize yourself more as being conformed to the pattern of this world. We've been looking at what it means to live as believers with a renewed mind. And we spent some time when we looked at the inner workings of the renewed mind. Now we're beginning to look at what that looks like from an external perspective, as in what we, what we believe and what we live, and what we embrace and what we reject, and what we accept, and so on. So I want to sort of continue that journey again today, a little bit down the path of where we went yesterday. So we're told in Romans, Paul tells us very clearly, do not conform to the pattern of this world. He's not giving his readers an option. He's not saying, if you, if you really, really feel like it, don't conform to the pattern of the world. He's not saying, I'd highly recommend. I just think, I just think as I think it would be really, really, really good for you. And so I'm just highly recommending that you don't conform to the pattern of this world. He doesn't leave room for us to think this is a suggestion or something that's a possibility or something that we even have much of a choice in. He's saying very, very clearly to his readers, do not. Everyone say, do not. Do not. Do not. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but do be transformed by the renewing of your mind. In other words, I don't want you to stay the person you are. I want you to change. But there's two avenues out there that are going to affect and cause, rub up against you and bring that change about. It's either going to be the pattern of the world in which you live. Now, to be conformed to the pattern of the world, it's not hard. My advice to you is just don't do anything. It'll just happen because you live here. And you're surrounded by it, and you'll just slowly meld into that pattern. But he says, if you don't want to just be conformed, then you've got to do the work of being transformed by renewing your mind. I can't renew your mind. You can't renew my mind. But you can renew your mind, and I can renew my mind. And the way that we renew our mind is we've got to start thinking the way that God wants us to think and, and following the things that God wants us to follow and doing what God wants us to do and resisting what he wants us to resist. There's no better way to do that or to find that out than to get into his word. Get into the Word of God and allow that to renew our minds. Get that in there to renew our minds. So I want to continue a little further down the road. Last week, we looked at the whole idea of God is love. And I heard from a few people were quite shocked that God is love is only mentioned in two scriptures in the entire New Testament. But it is. And somehow we've come to this conclusion that that is the one overriding aspect of God, which is 100% true. God is love, but the mistake we've made is we've allowed the world to interpret what love looks like instead of going to God who is love and letting God interpret what love looks like because He is love. The world is not love. So when the world tries to tell me what God is love looks like, what love looks like, I'm going to end up being conformed to the pattern of this world because they've got a very different view of love than God does. I myself as a believer have a very different view of love than God does. Anyone else like that? I, I, I see love a certain way and I find myself conflicted at times, wanting to go that way because my heart and my feelings are going there. But I know God is saying, but that's not love. That's not love. This is love over here. And I've got to take my cues of what love is from what God has to say. It reminds me of that, remember that foreigner song years ago? I want to know what love is. It's almost like the church cried that out. And then we said to the world, and hey, we want you to show me. And the world went, okay, here's what love is. And we got ourselves in all sorts of trouble. I think they sounded better than me, but that's a matter of perspective. Romans chapter 8. Let's keep going down that path a little bit today. Romans chapter 8, verse 5 to 8. Paul writes this to the Romans. He says, Those who live according to the flesh have their minds set on what the flesh desires. He says, those who, he said, in other words, the reason you're living for the flesh, he said, it's, it's not the action that's the primary thing. He said, it's because your mind's set on it. That's why you're doing it. That's why you're doing it. 
It's all going on up here. The battle is up here first and foremost. And whoever wins the battle up here, the flesh or the spirit, whoever wins the battle up here in your mind gets to control and dictate what it is that you will do with your life, which way you will bend, which way the pendulum will swing. Those who live according to the flesh have their minds set on what the flesh desires. But those who live according to the Spirit have their minds set on what the Spirit desires. I wonder if we stopped right there and just did an altar call and asked the question, how many of us with all honesty and sincerity, with the fear of God, could stand here and go, no, I think my mind is, is set on what the Spirit wants. And how many of us would go, you know what, if I'm honest, my mind is set on what the flesh wants. And that's part of my problem. That's why I keep going down the paths I do. That's why I can't break out of that thing. That's why I refuse to, to make the adjustments. Or change. Because I'm, my, my flesh is very real and alive and screaming and my mind's set on it because its voice is so much louder to me than the voice of God. The voice of my spirit is screaming at me every day. I want, I want, gimme, gimme, gimme. And the voice of the spirit is also there speaking to me. Which voice is loudest? And he says, the mind... Governed by the flesh is death. If our minds are constantly governed by the flesh, ultimately, at the end of the day, he said, it's going to lead to death. At the end of the day, the flesh is not going to take you to a place where you'll experience the life of the Holy Spirit and the freedom of God and the liberty of God and the opening of prison doors and the busting off of chains and everything that Jesus came to give us. If your mind is set on the flesh, it's not going to lead you there. It's going to lead you away. He says, but the mind governed by the Spirit is life and peace. And then he says this in verse 7, the mind governed by the flesh is hostile to God. Anytime you see somebody or a system or an ideology that is hostile to God, you know that that is a mind that is governed by the flesh. You know that that came from a mentality that was governed by the flesh. It didn't come from God. If it's hostile to God, it didn't come from God. If it's hostile to his word to his standards, to what he calls us to. It didn't come from God. He says, the mind governed by the flesh is hostile to God. Watch this. It does not submit to God's law, nor can it do so. It can't. If our minds are going to be governed by the flesh, we literally can't submit to God. We literally can't walk in the ways of God. It's just, it's not going to happen. And we can, we can go, I'm going to change and adjust and stop and look at all these things on the outs, outward. But if we're not changing up here, that's just going to be a fruitless battle and we will fail and fail and fail and get in that cycle of guilt and condemnation and all, all the cycles that we go through. Or because up here, we're not getting into here and going, well, God, I'm just going to make the decision. The only way to break out of all this is to get my mind transformed by your word. I've got to get in and see, what do you say about that? I know what Brad Pitt thinks about it because he puts it on TikTok and FaceTime and all that stuff. I know what, what, what you know, Taylor Swift says about it because she puts it in the songs. I know what, what, what the Prime Minister says about it. I know what Mum and Dad say about it. But God, what do you say about it? What do you say about it, God? Well, it's right here. God wants to speak to us. We have the Spirit and He's given us the Word and He wants to speak to us. He wants to speak to us. God's not hiding things from us like a cruel father. He's hiding things for us so that we will seek and find. Not seek and come up frustrated because God's going to keep it just that far away from you that you never get to find it. He hides things for us, not from us. The mind governed by the flesh does not submit to God's law. Now this tells me a couple of things. Number one, it tells me that there is such a thing as God's law still in 2024. We like to think in the New Testament, law and grace, and the Old Testament was all law, the New Testament's all grace, so the Old Testament was all law, there was no grace. You go back and read the Old Testament, there is so much grace in the Old Testament, it's unbelievable. The very fact that when Adam and Eve blew it, and that God, God still allowed them to breathe, was an act of grace. How easy would it have been back then to go, well, that was a failed experiment, let's snuff them out. Come up with something else. These animals are way better. They don't back chat. They don't disappear. <laughs> Make something else in your image again. You're kidding, God. What happened last time? Don't even do it. Stupid. There is a thing as God's law. In other words, God still, have, God still has in 2024 loving and logical limitations for life. God still has logical and loving limitations for life. He still has a way that he looks down, just, just like, like, like if, if the, the guy that created my first ever um, VHS player. Anyone remember VHS players? 
When I was a kid, my parents got a VHS player, and I remember it had a cord. You had to plug the cord in. Remember that? Plug the cord in, the, and then you could only go as far away as the cord allowed. And I put a blank tape in there in dire straits. We're doing a world tour back in, in sometime in the 80s. And I remember I sat up all night, and I pressed record, and then when an ad came on, I'd press pause. Yeah, anyone ever do that? And then when the ads were gone, you'd press the, off the pause button and start recording again. It was amazing. And the tape ran out. I had to quickly chuck another tape in there because I only went for so long. And then a mate of mine recently burned them on a DVD for me. It was awesome. All crackly and that. But every now and then you can see where I didn't pause in time and you get half of a Bing Lee ad or something coming across the screen, you know? Oh, greatest prices. Oh, I forgot. And then there's other times where I forgot to press it off and they're halfway through a song. And, ah. Anyway, if that concert's on DVD, let me know. I'll, I'll go and buy a fresh one. So there's still such a thing as God's law. God still has loving and logical limitations for us. And it's not because he hates us. It's not because he wants to destroy our life and destroy our fun. It's because he loves us. It's because he loves us. Romans 13, further on in Romans, verse 8 to 10, Paul says this. He says, Let no debt remain outstanding except the continuing debt to love one another. For whoever loves others has fulfilled the law. Right? So he's saying loving others is a fulfillment of the law. And then he says this, the commandments, the commandments. Everyone say commandments. The commandments, where were the commandments come from? They came from back there, didn't they? They came back from the Old Testament. Remember, they came back from the law. What are we talking about them for? It's all grace. It's all grace, right? He says, no, no, no. He says, for the commandments, and then he lists them. You shall not commit adultery, shall not murder, shall not steal, not covet, and whatever other commandment there may be, he says, they're summed up in this one command, love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no harm to a neighbor, therefore love is the fulfillment of the law. Paul is saying this, love your neighbor as yourself sums up the purpose of God's commandment. It doesn't do away with God's commandments. He's saying that love your neighbor is a summation of the commandments, not a do away with the commandments. In other words, loving my neighbor means living in obedience to the commandments of God. I can love nobody more highly than living a life personally that's in obedience with the word of God. That's the ultimate expression of love for my wife, for my children, for my community, for the church, for the society, for my nation. If I will live according to the commandments of God, that's the ultimate and highest expression of love for the people out there is for a church, for God's people to live in obedience and accordance to his word. That is the summation of the law. And there's nothing more loving we can do as a church than to actually stand on what God says and live it out. And live it out. God says, I want you to truly love one another. And if you do these things, in other words, the law, if you obey and do, do yes to what I say, yes, no to what I say, no, if you do that, you are truly loving one another. I'm ultimately loving you whenever I obey God. That's what he's saying. God's logical and loving limitations for life are in place as an act of love. The mind set on the spirit recognizes that. The mind set on the spirit recognizes that they're an act of love. The mindset on the flesh will struggle with it and battle with it and push against it and try to find loopholes and say, no, no, no. But that's not what Paul's saying. I asked my daughter, could I share this story? And she said, I could. So I'm going to share a story, just very brief. A few years back, my daughter was going through a, a, a difficult time in her life and, and me and her mother were trying to help her navigate her way through this really difficult time. And part of navigating her through that was having to say yes to certain things and no to certain things. It was allowing her to have certain freedoms, but at other times restricting those freedoms and limiting those freedoms and those opportunities. Sometimes it, it, it allowed her doing things and sometimes it didn't allow her to do things. And we came to a crescendo one day and I'll never forget it. And if you're a parent here and your child ever turns around to you and says, I hate you, you'll remember that. She turned to me one day and she looked at me with venom and just said, I hate you. I hate you. I hate you. You see, the reason she hated me was because she was interpreting what I was doing, what I was saying no to, and what I was saying yes to, what I was allowing, what I was disallowing. She was interpreting that as an act of hate. And so she retaliated by saying, I hate you. Why? Because what you're doing and saying or not saying or not allowing is telling me you hate me. Now, a couple of years on, she'll now say to me, you know what? I'm glad you did that. I know you weren't, I know what you were doing was not an act of hate. It was an act of love. You did that because you loved me. 
not because you hated me. So she was interpreting it wrong. Now, here's the question. Imagine if I'd compromised my love for her by just going along with whatever she was feeling at the time. Imagine if I just compromised my love for her by just going, oh, well, if that's what you feel, you know, and yeah, whatever, whatever you want. You can have whatever you want, do whatever you want, and so on. I can tell you now, I don't think my daughter would be the woman that she is right now had we just compromised on everything and just let her do whatever it is that she wanted. That would not have been love. That would not have been love. But the world would say, no, that, that would be love. Because she feels that, so just go with it. She wants that, so just go with it. Just whatever people feel, whatever, they, that, that's love. That's just love, let them go. But that wouldn't be love. That wouldn't be love. People end up in all kinds of messes because we don't want to say, we think it's an unloving thing. We've been, we've been told this and we've been duped into thinking that by having a standard or a set of values or something that we won't go past, we've been told time and again, the church, you guys are unloving. You're unloving because you just won't let the world be a free-for-all. You're unloving because you're upholding these archaic, old-fashioned standards. And it's not. We're not being unloving. What would have been unloving was if I had have had that same attitude with my daughter and just let her get away with anything and do anything and never, never in love be able to pull her up, never in love be able to give another perspective, never in love offer another side to the story or another opinion, never, never in love be able to put a bit of distance between this and what you're wanting to do or what you're saying. That would not have been loving. And I hate to think, and I said to her, I, 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 I asked her this, I shared this very thought with her. And I said to her, like, in, in hindsight, what if I had gone along with that? Like, do you think we did the right thing? And she said, yes, you did. I can see that now. And there are a lot of people out there in the world, and they can't see it right now. But if the church was to stand up and to go, no, 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 this is how God made the world. This is what we believe. And we're not going to bend and buckle. I wonder whether right now they might kick and scream and look at us and go, we hate you. But who knows what's going to happen down the track? Who knows what's going to happen down the track if we would find our voice and stand? Compromising personal preferences can be an act of love. What do you want for dinner tonight, darling? The story normally goes like this. She goes, I don't care, I'll have anything. And I'll go, okay, well, what about KFC? She'll go, I don't want that. And I'll pull my hair out going, well, you just said anything. You know, anyone else? Yeah, see, this is so com- This is one of those things that, as the Bible would say, is common to men. <laughs> Wives, partners, spouses, girlfriends, just pick the meal. We actually, when we say we don't care, we mean it, all right? We don't need this. We don't care. You obviously do. Just pick the meal. There's some counselling. I've just saved a few marriages right there, I reckon. <laughs> compromising personal preferences can be an act of love, but compromising on God's standards is actually an act of rebellion that the Bible calls sin. Compromising on where we go on holidays or how much money we're going to spend on a lounge or what colour the car is going to be or what football game we're going to watch or where we're going to watch it. Compromising on those things is an act of love. Compromising on God's standards is actually an act of rebellion against the one that set those standards. And the Bible calls rebellion sin. It calls it sin. Now, Revelation chapter 2 verse 6 I want to just speak a little bit about a group of people that you've probably heard of They're, again just like God is love is mentioned twice this group are mentioned twice in the New Testament both times in the book of Revelation anyone ever heard of a group called the Nicolaitans anyone ever heard of the Nicolaitans we're going to have a look at just a couple of passages about the Nicolaitans in the, New Test- in, in the book of Revelation in Revelation 2 6 uh, 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 John has this vi- the book of Revelation is this vision that, that the, uh, uh, John had while he was in exile on the island of Patmos. And he had this, this end time sort of vision. And uh, there's all kinds of analogies and pictures and things in there. And, and it's not to be taken literal. You know, God doesn't have seven heads like a lion and this and like it, 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 There's a lot of pictures and imagery in there. But there's a point where these angels come and they speak about uh, this, this group of seven churches, seven big areas where churches were. And... and they address them in different ways, but two of the churches I want to have a look at very briefly. In Revelation chapter 2, verse 6, they're talking about the church in the city of Ephesus. And here's what verse 6 says, but you have this in your favor. See, there were some things that the angel said, you know, you've got this issue, this problem, I'm not really. But then he said this, but this is in your favor. I like this about you guys. You hate the practices of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. There's God saying there's some stuff going on there. I want you to know, I hate that stuff. I hate that stuff. God who is love says, I hate that stuff. Love itself says, I hate that stuff. Love hates at times. 
all right? He says, I hate that stuff that's going on with this group called the Nicolaitans. Revelation 2, verse 12 to 16 is the only other time Nicolaitans are mentioned, and this is the church at Pergamum. And he says this, these are the words of him who has the sharp, double-edged sword. I know where you live, where Satan has his throne. Now, Without going into detail, you go and have a look at the city of Pergamum and you look at what was going on in that city. It had all kinds of altars and stuff to foreign gods and there was all kinds of demonic stuff going on in that place. There was a a shrine built for emperor worship. uh, They worshipped the god Dionysus uh, and the the worship of Dionysus was so licentious and immoral that Rome itself, the city of Rome, banned it from happening in Rome. Even the Romans Even the Romans said that is way too immoral. Well, Pergamum had a temple there and they were worshipping these gods as well. And he says, yet you remain true to my name. So there were some believers in the midst of that culture that he said, you remain true to my name. That's a good thing. You stood and you remain true to my name. You didn't renounce your faith in me, not even in the days of Antipas, my faithful witness who was put to death in your city. So there's a guy killed in that city, but he said, there was a group of you, you still stood your ground, you didn't bow, you didn't bend. Nevertheless, verse 14, I have a few things against you. There are those among you who hold to the teaching of Balaam, who taught Balak to entice the Israelites to sin. Long story short, you can go back in the book of of Numbers, maybe 22, somewhere around there. Um, uh, uh, Balak, uh, king, I think of the Moabites might have been, he came and said to Balaam, will you curse God's people, Uh, prophesy and curse them? And Balaam said... I can't, God wouldn't let him, long story short. And so uh, instead of cursing them and getting all the goodies off Balak, the Balak said, I'm going to give you if you do this. Uh, At the end of the day, Balaam kind of found a way around that. And he eventually said to Balak, hey, here's the deal. I can't curse them. God won't let me because they're they're believing in God. They're walking with God and his protection and power is there. What you've got to do is get them to compromise. So uh, Balaam said to Balak, send the Moabite women down there amongst the Israeli men and get them to seduce them and tell them that you can have us physically, just got to bow to our God and then we'll, we'll give ourselves to you. So they went down there and they did it. They compromised God's people and enticed them towards sin. Just compromise a little bit. Just, 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 just accept this and accept that. And if you compromise enough, Balaam's theory was that the hand of God will be removed and then you can go on in and attack them because the power and the presence of God will move. The Nicolaitans, and then he goes on from there. He says uh, 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 in, in verse uh, 15, he says, Likewise, you also have those who hold to the teaching of the Nicolaitans. Then he says, Repent, therefore, otherwise I will soon come to you and I will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. So here's what we know written just in those two passages. Number one, we know that Jesus hated the teachings of the Nicolaitans. We know that the Ephesians also hated the teachings of the Nicolaitans, and God uh, uh, congratulated them, commended them for it. And we know that the church of Pergamum had some who were holding to the teachings of the Nicolaitans and they were rebuked. So who were the Nicolaitans and what were their teachings? I'll cut a very, very long story short here. Acts chapter 6 verse 5, when there was a a dispute about the Greek-speaking widows and Jewish-speaking widows and the food distribution, the passage is up there. Uh, The disciples decided we can't get away from preaching the word and so on. So what we need to do is let's get some people who can take on this ministry on board and start serving uh, the widows. And it says the proposal pleased the whole group. They chose Stephen, a man full of faith, and of the Holy Spirit also Philip, Prochorus, Nicanor, Timon, Parmenas, and Nicholas, Nicolaitans. So the Nicolaitans uh, were a sect that grew out of this man, Nicholas. Now, what we know about Nicholas, it tells us he was from Antioch and he was a convert to Judaism. So you've got this guy that was, was, was brought up in Antioch. He was a pagan worshiper. And then he converts from paganism to Judaism. And then he converts from Judaism to Christianity. Now, they don't know. Most of what we read about the Nicolaitans, we get outside of the Bible from the early church fathers' writings and stuff about them. But here's one writing from Irenaeus, Irenaeus of Lyon, in his book Against Heresies. He says, The Nicolaitans are the followers of that Nicholas, who was one of the seven first ordained to the diaconate by the apostles. They lead lives of unrestrained indulgence. They lead lives of unrestrained indulgence. So what happened was over time, church historians, you can't put our finger on whether it came directly from Nicholas or whether it came from his followers and was passed down. Eventually what they ended up doing was embracing ideas from culture and other religions, bringing them all in together and saying, you can have this mashup of ideas and beliefs and God will still be happy with you. It's all good. You can bring this in from your culture. That in from your culture, that in from this other religion, this in from this other religion, and God is okay with it. This is what the Nicolaitans believed. 
And we see very clearly in the book of Revelation that Jesus says, those that follow those teachings, he says, I'm rebuking you. And those who stood against it, he says, I commend you. I commend you. Christianity is not a mishmash of a whole kind of ideas and whatever feels good or works for us in the current culture or the current age in which we live. I didn't create this religion. I didn't come up with the rules. I didn't create the universe. God did. Therefore, he's the only one that has the right to say, this is how it works. This is how it works. The Nicolaitans were calling, uh, some, calling evil things good and they would call good things evil. And they also had the teachings of Balaam, so they were enticing other believers to believe it too, enticing them to come along into sin. And the Bible's very clear, man, if you're going to do that to another believer, go and tie an anchor around your neck and jump off the deepest bridge. It's going to be way better for you than standing before God knowing that you are somebody that enticed God's children to sin. He says it's not good. God's not into it. Now, after speaking of being justified by faith in the book of Romans... After speaking of how God demonstrates his love for us by dying for us while we're still sinners, after speaking of the life we have through Jesus Christ and his death and his resurrection, after telling us that where sin abounds, grace abounds more, Paul then brings this warning to the Romans in Romans 6.1. He says this, what shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning? In other words, there's still a thing called sin. I know we don't like it. I, know we, I don't like it. I'm just being honest and going, I hate the idea that God doesn't like some things, especially that he doesn't like some things that I feel like I like. I hate the fact that I can't just do whatever I want because sometimes I just want to do whatever I want. But I've got this God standing there going, yeah, I know that's what you want, but do you want to follow me as well? Which one's more important to you? Having that or following me? Your choice. He says, shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? Because he's just finished saying where sin abounds, grace abounds more. They go, well, this is the point. The more sin, the more grace. If there's more sin, there's more grace. It doesn't matter how much sin you have. There's so much more grace and it's all good. We can just keep sinning because grace is abounding. And he says, shall we go on sinning? He says, by no means. We are those who have died to sin. How can we live in it any longer? We've died to sin. How can we live in it? Love doesn't open prison doors, then say, now go do anything you want. The reason it doesn't do that is because anything you want landed you in prison in the first place. Continue down that path and you could end up straight back in prison. Love not only opens the prison door, it also tells you the path to walk in order to stay free. The Nicolaitans were happy to compromise with other religions and cultures and God rebuked them for it. Wrong was and still is wrong. When I went to school, I failed a lot of exams. Anybody like me? I failed a lot of exams. I, I didn't pass many, actually. I, 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 very, very few exams. But here's the amazing thing. This is, what, this is the thing, and I think it was unfair. I, I'm just being honest with you and saying I think I was hard done by it. Because I would, I would have a question, and I would answer a question a certain way. Right? Here's my answer. This is what I believe the answer is. And, and you know what, the, you know what the, 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 the examiners would do? They would have the hide to come to me and go, your answer's wrong. I'm thinking, oh my goodness, that's a bit hard, isn't it? What, what, you know what I would have done? I would have gone, that's your answer? Well, hang on, let me go and change the question so that your answer's right. And that's what compromise is. Compromise is changing the question so that the answer's always yes. Compromise is changing the question so that the answer is always yes. We change the question to fit the answer. We don't have a right to change the question. Just because an answer's wrong. The most loving thing that those examiners could have done to me is to tell me, hey, that answer's actually wrong. Because it was wrong. (laughs) But apparently, according to life and according to God, nothing's wrong. You can do whatever you want. Be whatever you want. Billy Graham once said this. He said, from compromise to deceit is a very, very small step. Compromise over here leads to this, leads to that. I heard a story recently that made me think about compromise. There was a hunter and he had a gun and he walked into a forest and he was, saw a bear there and he walked up behind the bear and he cocked the gun and went the noise of the cocking of the gun, the bear turned around. And the bear put his paws up and went, hey, isn't it better that we talk rather than you shoot? <laughs> and the hunter went, oh, yeah, I guess it is. Then the bear said to the hunter, what do you want? And the hunter said, well, I just want a fur coat. And then the hunter said, well, that's a fair question that's very polite so what do you want so the bear said well I just want a full belly so the hunter put his gun down and the bear said well maybe we can compromise he said good idea so they walked off into the woods together <laughs> five minutes later the bear came out by himself <laughs> the hunter got his fur coat and the bear got his full belly <laughs> but guess what somebody always loses in a compromise somebody lost in that compromise didn't they that compromise brought life to somebody but ultimately it brought death to somebody else. 
You might think in the moment that compromise takes the pressure off you. But in the long run, it puts the pressure on someone somewhere. And I dare say this to the church, when we compromise in this generation now, you know where the pressure is going to fall? It's going to fall on those kids in that room there. It's going to fall on those children running around up the back that have a heart for and want to follow Jesus. And by the time they get to sitting in the chairs where you are with the life you've got, what are they going to be hearing? What is a narrative? Who's going to be telling them that this is old and it doesn't mean anything anymore? And you know, we, I, I listened to a, a preacher, a pastor um, this week online and he's got a massive following, getting a bigger and bigger following. And, and, and I, I, here's, here's what he promotes himself as. He is a gay pastor. And he got on there and he expounded Genesis. He said the serpent came and said, did God really say that if you eat of that tree that you'll die? And they said, yeah, God did. We can eat anything and not that one. And the serpent goes, well, that's actually not true. You know, God just doesn't want you to have knowledge. And then he turned it around and he said, God was the liar. Because God wants you to have knowledge, doesn't he? And if you eat the tree, you have knowledge. The serpent told the truth. He's got a growing number of people following. You know why? Because it sounds really, really good, doesn't it? It sounds really clever. It sounds really clever, especially if your heart and your mind are set on the things of the flesh. That's a great doctrine. That sounds awesome. That sounds awesome. So God exists to restrict my lifestyle. God exists just to, to, to say, don't go out there because there are some really good things I want to keep you away from. I don't quite think that's exactly what it means. See, we need to follow the word, not the world. We need to be led by the spirit of God, not the spirit of the age. We need to live by conviction, not by convenience. We need to be transformed, not conformed. Not conformed. Um, I'm just going to read this through really, really quickly because we're going to get to the barbecue. Second Samuel chapter 11 is a great picture. If you've got some time, read it yourself, the story of David and Bathsheba. If you want to get an idea of how compromise will take you down a slippery slope from one thing to another. 2 Samuel 11, 1, in the spring, at the time when kings go off to war, David sent Joab out with the king's men and the whole Israelite army. They destroyed the Ammonites and besieged Rabbah, but David remained in Jerusalem. David compromised his identity as the king. He should have been out there with his troops. He should have been out there leading them into battle. And instead of out there uh, living, his, living his identity, living the destiny that God had called him to, he compromises. And it says, at the time when the kings go forth to battle. Now, here's the thing. There are, lots of, there, there are reasons why a military king would stay back from battle. There are actually reasons back in that culture in that day. But it's very, very mindful to me that the writer here and that the Holy Spirit moved upon this man that wrote this and said to him, make sure you put at the beginning at the time when kings go forth to battle. You need to know that piece of information. See, I believe David was meant to be out there in battle, but he compromised his identity as king and he stayed home. In verse 2, one evening David got up from his bed and walked around on the roof of the palace and from the roof he saw a woman bathing. He compromised his identity as king and once he did that, the next thing, he compromised that which he was focusing on. Now he's standing on the roof and he looks across and he sees this beautiful woman. The Bible says she's fair to look upon and he sees her there. And then once he'd focused, compromised on what he was looking at, the next thing, verse 4, then David sent messages to get her. She came to him and he slept with her. He's a man who's a man after God's own heart. He compromises where he's meant to be. She'll be out to war. Then that compromise leads to the next one. He compromises on what he's focused on. Should have been focused on winning a battle with his troops. He said he's focusing on a beautiful woman across there. Then when he's focused on that and he compromises that, the next one, now he gets that woman, takes her in. She's not his wife and he sleeps with her. And it doesn't stop there. In verse 14 and 15, in the morning, David wrote a letter to Joab and sent it with Uriah. The woman falls pregnant. And David tries to cover his tracks and he can't. So it's a last ditch resort. He says to Joab, he says, uh, 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 put Uriah out in front where the fighting is fiercest. Uriah was the legitimate husband of this woman. Put Uriah out front where the fighting is fiercest. Then withdraw from him so he'll be struck down and die. This is the king of Israel. Should be protecting these people, looking after these people. And to cover his own tracks, he resorts to murder. And it started by just not being where he should be, not walking in his identity, not doing and being who he was called to be at the time, which was the king. I, I think there's a little picture in there for the church. We are children of God. We are sons and daughters of God. We are called to be Christ's ambassadors. And if we compromise our identity and try to mingle it in with culture and mingle it in with all kinds of other things, we sacrifice at that level. Once you compromise there, it's a slippery slope. Where does the compromise end? 
At what point do we go, enough is enough, that's far enough, we can't compromise that. Once upon a time, we would never have compromised marriage. Now we seem to be okay. We would never compromise it. God made a male and female. Then it kind of becomes okay. Once upon a time, we wouldn't compromise on sin, and then it kind of becomes okay. At what point? What's the marker? Where's that bottom level? Where are we? Here? We'll keep going until we hit there, and then it won't go any further. Well, ask Christians, ask, ask your great, great, great grandparents whether they would have ever thought we'd end up here. And I'll bet you they would have laughed at you and gone, no, that won't happen. We fear God in this nation. We're a Christian nation. David's slippery slope began. I'll just get the band back. We're about to finish up. Get you guys to come back up. I want to pray. Uh, we're going to go out there. We're going to have a barbecue but, but, uh, and tea and coffee. But I want to open up the front this morning. I want to pray for some people. If, if, if you feel that, that God is speaking to you, I want to pray with some people this morning. See, the lie of the enemy is this. There's good stuff out there that God wants, you, wants to keep you from. That's the lie of the enemy. That's what he did in the Garden of Eden. And here's the fact. The tree looked good. It was pleasing to the eye, it says in Genesis. And when they ate the fruit, it probably even tasted good. I bet you it felt good in the moment. But it wasn't good. So even though it looked good to them and probably tasted good to them, and in the moment it felt good to them, it was still God who determined whether it was actually good for them. At the end of the day, it's God. God said, don't eat. Because he loved them. He said, don't eat because he loved them. Don't eat because he loved them. But they just went with what they saw, what felt good, what seemed good. There were two of them there. One of them could have spoken up. Why didn't Adam go, Eve, no? Instead, he took the easy road and went, okay, let's keep the peace. I don't want to disrupt the apple cart, so to speak. Boom, boom, apple. I don't want to cause an argument. I don't want this to escalate. I don't want to be seen as I'm killing your fun or killing your joy, Eve. So, uh, yeah, okay. And then God comes along and it wasn't good. Love doesn't always say yes. Sometimes it says no. It doesn't always pat me on the back. Sometimes it smacks me on the backside. That's love. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 3 to 4. Timothy says this, For the time will come when people will not put up with sound doctrine, instead to suit their own desires. Eve did what she did, it suited their desires. It says, Instead to suit their own desires, they'll gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. There's this desire to want to hear something. I've got it. I'm I'm telling you, I'm a pastor and I've got that desire. I want to find a preacher that'll tell me this is okay because my flesh wants certain things. And guess what? They're out there. But I've got to keep coming back to this. The time will come when people will not put up with sound doctrine. Instead, to suit their own desires, they'll gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. They will turn their ears away from the truth and turn aside to myths. Things that suit their own desires to justify their version of who God is to justify their lifestyle choices, to eliminate restrictions to those things that their flesh wants. I I think we're we're kind of standing there. Charles Spurgeon put it this way, the prince of preachers. He said, a time will come when instead of shepherds feeding the sheep, the church will have clowns entertaining the goats. Instead of shepherds feeding the sheep, Church will have clowns entertaining the goats. We're going through a season where the church is being challenged by relative truth of culture, and the church should be challenging the world with the absolute truth of God. We can sit back and blame the world for the way we're going, or we can stand up in love and start offering an alternative to the lies that are out there. The truth is God declares it, but that's going to take a lot of courage. That's going to take a lot of boldness from people. Culture's not going to change because people stand here on a Sunday and preach a message to people like you. It's going to change when people like you and me for the other six and a half days get out there and take a stand for what we know is right. In love, in love. But you've got to take that stand. In 168 AD, Polycarp, the Bishop of Smyrna, which is modern-day Turkey, he was martyred 
He was the last living link to the 12 apostles. He studied under the apostle John and he was actually appointed Bishop of Smyrna by the apostle John. He was taken into the arena to be burned. He was given an option. He could have got out of it. All he had to say was two words. Kaisa Kyrios. Kaisa Kyrios. Which translated means Caesar is Lord. That's all he had to say. Kaisa Kyrios. Kaisa Kyrios. And he would have lived on to a ripe old age. He was already 86, by the way, when he was martyred. He said this to them. He said, you threaten me with fire that will burn for an hour and then will go out. But you're ignorant of the fire of the future judgment God reserves for the everlasting torment of the ungodly. But why do you delay? Bring on the beasts. Bring on the fire or whatever you choose. You shall not move me to deny Christ, my Lord, my Kyrios, my Lord and my Saviour. And they kept marching him in to burn him. And several witnesses to that execution have written in church history that they heard a voice come down to him. And the voice said this, Polycarp, play the man. In other words, stand your ground, have courage, stop, don't back down. You're here for such a time as this. He had a dream some months before that laid his head on his pillow and the pillow turned to fire. And he knew. He knew there's going to come a time where I'm going to have to draw a line in the sand and I'm going to have to stand with courage and faith and trust God with my life. That's what an uncompromised life looks like. When we stand firm and we play the man or we play the woman. I want to pray for people today. Here's what I want to do. We're going to move on in the next few weeks. We're going to start to talk about a few more sort of cultural things, but I just want to lay a foundation here. You know, with knowledge comes responsibility. Who knows that? Yep. We're going to unpack some things in the Bible in the next few weeks. We're going to look at a few things to do with culture. And when we, we might not have known some stuff, but when we look at it and we see it, with that knowledge comes a responsibility to live in the light of the knowledge that we know. And I know that we live in a day and an age where... Standing for God can cost you. We're, we're already there. We're already there. It can cost you friendships. It can cost you family members. It can cost you relationships. It can cost you money. It can cost you your job. We've been reading in the newspaper in the last couple of years, people here, it's cost them careers, cost them sponsorships, cost them opportunities. It closes doors. Why? Because they just would not say, Kaisa, Kyrios. There is one Lord. There is one Saviour. There is one maker of truth, one upholder of truth. And his name was Jesus. He said, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. And God will share his glory with nobody else. Chucking vegetables out there today. Here's what I want to do. If you want to go and have lunch, that's completely fine. Let's get out there, let's enjoy our lunch and so on. But I want to pray for some people here today. I'm challenged by Polycarp. I'm challenged. And I, I, me, I want to play the man. I want to play the man. I don't even want there to look like there's room that I'm compromising on what I believe anymore. I don't want to try to take the palatable easy way out while culture continues to eat us and we feel like, well, that's a fair compromise. We've got our fur coat. Yeah, but it's the bear still running around in the woods getting stronger while we're slowly fading into oblivion and disappearing. So I want to pray for some people this morning. If that's you, if you feel like the Lord's speaking to you, I, I would love you to come up. I want to pray, and this is my prayer, I want to pray for boldness and I want to pray for courage. I don't know what your week's going to look like, your month, your year ahead. I don't know what decisions you're going to have to be confronted with. I don't know who you're, you, you may end up in a conversation with. I don't know. But, but I pray uh, that you would have confidence and boldness and that in love you would be able to stand firm and as Polycarp said, play the man. Amen? Amen. So let's stand to our feet. Like I said, you want to go and have lunch and that, please feel free to go. I'm going to get these guys to play. and We're going to hang around the front here and I would love to pray. And we're praying for boldness and for confidence to stand firm in a culture of compromise. Amen. Thank you, Lord.
Bless you, God. Well, Father, I want to thank you for this morning, Lord. I thank you for each person that's here. Lord, I pray in the name of Jesus, if you have been speaking to people, that God, you would move upon their hearts, Father. If people need to uh, come forward as an act of faith, if they need to come forward this morning, God, just as a, 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 an act of faith between you and them, an acknowledgement that, Holy Spirit, you are speaking to them, then, Father, I pray that they would not miss this moment, that they would not walk away, they would not justify why I don't need to or why I shouldn't, but, Lord, we would lean in. And I pray today we would lean in to all that you have for us, Father. And I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.